Welcome to this topic on graph coloring. Uh, there are 10 small miniatures which I want to talk about and that will be it because uh, graph coloring is a little bit like wearing the ring. Of course you cannot wear the ring uh, uh, as, as real because you disappear but uh, you have to wear the ring <coughs> you have to wear the ring around your your neck and uh, it's a heavy burden and the reason why this is such a tough topic is that a lot of mistakes have been done in the past when dealing with uh, uh, graph coloring but I'm uh, not doing difficult things here kind of capturing low hanging fruits sitting on the shoulders of giants like Fisk so Fisk will be kind of one of the major pioneers when uh, using topolo topological methods for uh, graph coloring. And we will see there's a lots of interesting mathematics in wolves like uh, knots. I mean, this is a real uh, knots in, for example, a, a curve in a three dimensional sphere. And we will see that. So they, they, they appear in, uh, in, in graph coloring. But what we are doing is we uh, restrict ourselves to graphs, which are manifolds, D manifolds. I have you the definition again on the top so D-manifolds are very natural classes of graphs and uh, I believe that uh, uh, there is a polynomial algorithm to, to, to uh, color a general uh, D-dimensional manifold while uh, in general it's a hard problem, it's an NP-hard problem. Uh, and similarly then uh, uh, Hamiltonian, finding Hamiltonian paths that's relatively easy in D-manifolds but it's a general NP-complete uh, problem. <clears throat> So the first uh, thing, so there are 10 topics uh, which I want to talk about. The first one is a, a general upper bound on the chromatic number of D-manifolds, which I have already talked about last time. I want to say a little bit more about the proof because it's a little bit uh, harder than I actually thought. So it might be actually getting to the realm where it's publishable. And then I want to talk about minimal spheres. So this is not new here. Uh, this part is actually essentially due to uh, he would, this is uh, uh, the, the fourth part is essentially Whitney. So there's, there are conditions which uh, allow you to, to have a, a geodesic flow. This is about the, the, the constraint disappear also on the boundary. We don't really need that for coloring uh, the interior. And then a very beautiful formula of Fisk about this uh, odd set. We'll talk about this odd set. That's kind of the major thing. This odd set is, a, is a ma typically a manifold which uh, prevents you to minimally color the manifold. And then in the last thing is something very exciting about, uh, also this is not, I have nothing original here, but about global constraints, which I believe also in higher dimensions are present, but which are completely unexplored in higher dimensions only. So that's the plan. So there are 10 miniature topics. So the first topic deals with the upper bound is 2D plus 2. It's just twice the chromatic number of uh, the minimal the minimal thing so if you have a if you have a three manifold for example so what we have is that the maximal simplices are tetrahedra and uh, you need four colors for coloring the tetrahedra now what you do is when you color that you you can you can take when you want to you, you want to color it with four colors you put three colors here this color you can reuse here now you can continue. If you put the new titrator on here, you get you get the red here. You are forced to have a red here, and so on. This continues. But we have seen that last time in the last video that what happens is if you go around, of course, you what you have is then and you have that the red comes here. So then it has to again a green, and then it has to have a, a even parity. This edge is a, a, an odd edge if the if the number of titrator which are hinging on, on, on it is odd. And that then makes this part uh, part of the odd O, we call this O of M, which is in three dimensions, just a one dimensional uh, object, typically a one dimensional closed curve. It has to be a closed or union of closed curves, but sometimes it's a closed curve. So when is it a, a manifold in higher dimensions? Odd set is in general defined, it's the intersection of, so you take a D minus two simplex in three dimensions, it, it's a one simplex, and you take the intersection of all unit spheres there. And this set uh, OM is really the constraint to color uh, a manifold with a minimal number of colors. 
So for example, if you take the icosahedron like here, this art set consists of all vertices. All vertices are art, right? All the vertex cardinalities are five, so they are art. So I need four colors here. And uh, so it, the, the constraint is at every point. You only need one vertex where this happens and the whole thing is, the minimal coloring is destroyed. But they always appear in pairs. One of the reasons is the Euler handshake formula, right? The number of odd degree vertices in a two-dimensional sphere or actually in, in any graph is, has, to be, has to be even because that's twice the number of edges by the, by the handshake formula, which is kind of a gauss bonnet a special case of gauss bonnet It's a very interesting thing to, to look at the case when you can do it with minimal amount of uh, colorings. But the first topic is actually just looking at the upper bound. So what we do is, when we have this, we take these simplices and we expand them as long as we kind of don't get the closed loop. So these simplices are the vertices of the dual graph. I call this G hat. The dual graph, for example, of the icosahedron is the dodecahedron, so where the, the simplices are the points and you connect to if they are uh, adjacent in the sense that they share a d minus one dimensional uh, simple. Dual graph has no triangles by definition, it follows from the basic definition of the, of the, of the manifold. And so this is, a, this is a, a graph without triangles. And what we want to do is when we cannot continue, we want just to take a completely set different set of colors. This is a graph without triangles and uh, the claim is that I can color color it in, in, in with two colors in such a way that there is no closed loop with the same color. It's actually interesting to look at graphs without triangles. There is a theorem of uh, a Grudge which says that in the planar case you can color it with three colors but there are examples of graphs without triangles which have arbitrary large chromatic numbers. So having no triangles is no constraint about having about the, 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 chrom the chromatic number. But uh, how can you color it with two colors? I mean, uh, we, we, are, we are allowed to use the, the, the same color as long as they don't form a closed loop. So what we essentially have, we, we, we can partition this into two forests and each forest has then trees and each tree has no, uh, there's no closed loop. So every the forest uh, one gives us the, the coloring of the of, of the first batch of, of simplices, maximal simplices, and the second forest gives us the, the coloring of the second batch of simplices. Uh, there is a little bit of a cohomology which has to come in. So what we have is this is a, a graph which has only zero zero cohomology and one cohomology. So the the, the zero cohomology is just uh, has it was one dimensional because it's a connect, connected graph. And then there is a, a, a b-dimensional space of uh, harmonic forms. b is, is the first Betty number. And 1 minus b is then the Euler characteristic or the Euler Poincaré formula. So the number of vertices minus the number of edges is 1 minus b. So uh, what happens is this b is always smaller than the number of edges. So what we have to do is we have to break all cycles. And so what we do is can we break all cycles to get the tree? And then a tree we can always color with two colors and then we put it together again. But so we have to do the cutting in such a way that we never have a closed loop. I have can take away B edges so that I get a tree. It's no problem to color a tree with two colors. We have no, never a problem because we have no closed, we have no closed, uh, uh, closed loop. We never get to this constraint. Now, uh, what you have to see, is it possible to cut away B uh, edges so that they don't close, form a closed loop? And that's possible, and you can do that by uh, induction. So if there would be a closed loop, which you cannot avoid cutting everything away, this would actually mean every closed loop attached to it would also have to, to have this uh, uh, property. And so you could, you could inductively show that everything would have to be cut away. There are more edges than you have a, uh, than, than B. And the number of edges is actually the number of vertices plus B minus one by this Euler uh, Poincaré formula. That it's not the coloring, but it's uh, the, the colors can be, you know, adjacent uh, vertices can have the same color, but you cannot have a closed loop with the same color. So that's kind of a kind of, a, kind of a, like a homotopy version of the of the coloring problem. <clears throat> it's a cute little result in graph theory. 
and uh, uh, so and uh, that immediately implies then you can color the the dual graph with these two colors and so that no closed loop has the same color and this means then that we can color the original graph that he would extension procedure now works in every uh, tree of that uh, of a specific color that's the proof of the of the first uh, of the first uh, result so it's extremely low hanging fruit and uh, i mentioned last time i think it is not optimal actually there is a, a, a one can conjecture that it's just a, the ceiling function of d of instead of two you actually expect that you can take it with a with three half so if you take three half three half times d plus one and then you take the ceiling function <coughs> 3 half d plus 1 times the ceiling function is probably an upper bound which is which is which is still true case d equal to 1 this gives us 3 so in the case d equal to 1 so that that works in the in the case of d equal to 2 so we get 9 half uh, so that the ceiling is 5 so it gives us 5 which is probably uh, the true that, so it would be in extremely interesting to see whether this one can do this uh, sharper sharper estimate three half growth rate like three half but not growth rate uh, two times d plus one maybe i'll show you the graph here which uh, uh, consists of all examples we know and the upper bound and the lower bound d plus one the upper bound t two d plus one and this conjectured upper bound three half d plus one that's the first uh, uh, topic now the second and third topic, this is actually all related, this is this uh, Hebrew idea which is extremely interesting. So when you have a D-manifold, what you can do is you can, like a three-manifold, what you can do is you take, you have a, a notion of degree. And the notion of the degree is because that, that simplex now, uh, the intersection of the unit sphere is a circular graph. And it's a unit sphere in the unit sphere. The unit sphere is two-dimensional. Uh, unit sphere and unit sphere is one dimensional it's a circle so a circular graph so it either is odd or even if it is even you just don't mention it if it's odd then that that, that leads to a constraint you call this part of o of uh, this o of m is a d minus two dimensional simplicial complex within the within the within the graph and it turns out it's a union of manifolds and the reason is when you look at the unit sphere so in this case one two three four five this edge here is in the in o uh, in o uh, g so this is a odd odd edge and uh, what happens is when you have an odd edge this odd word this means that the, the 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 vertex degree of the unit sphere in the unit sphere is odd so because of the handshake formula of Euler there will be another vertex here with odd degree so you can continue that you can go like this it's never possible that that this O of M is kind of stuck at some some place as a, as a boundary so it's a it's kind of like a variety it's a union of actually union of circles always a union of circles and so if this is absent so if there is no of this no of this constraint what you can do if there is no none such constraint, you have a, you you are able to color everything with a minimal amount of colors. So in this case, this is not possible. But what you can do is you can edge uh, refine, and that's what we come come next. So this is an extremely interesting uh, topic already in two dimensions. So you have a two dimensional sphere, and you want to edge refine it, and uh, so uh, a two dimensional sphere is colorable by by uh, three colors if and only if every vertex degree is even so meaning that this fisk variety is empty so that's the idea of he would already a very early idea in graph color in higher dimensions in four dimensional manifolds it's odd odd triangles these are triangles which uh, at, at which an odd number of hyper uh, titrator are hinging on that's odd then you cannot uh, color it four dimensions with five color, and that's only true in this in the sphere case, simply connected case. I mean, in general, it's true in simply connected cases here, but spheres are simply connected. This is this uh, number two. 
Now, uh, you can also look at this story in the case of manifolds with boundary. And that's what, what, what I was especially interested in when you are coloring, when you're coloring a two sphere, you can write it as a, a boundary of a, of a three ball. And then uh, you can try to color that three ball. Now, what happens is, again, that, that is the, the same idea. When you have in the interior, you have no edge, no odd, uh, uh, no odd simplex. If this this O of uh, G is empty, then in the interior, or O of G is only part of the boundary, then you can do this coloring in the inside. You color one simplex, maximal simplex, and you can, just by the simply connectedness, you can con continue everywhere and do it, uh, color everything. <clears throat> so you can do that without getting into into kind of global constraints like on, on, a, on, on a torus. Very interesting what happens on a torus, for example, or higher de de a genus surface, you get this uh, uh, constraint. So that's, that's quite an interesting thing. So for example, here, uh, in this case, so this two, three, four, five, this is, a, this is a disc. So there's one point in the interior. What you can do is now you can edge refine this. So you can uh, edge refine this. So what you can do is you can actually do something like that and only the 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 odd part is only on the on the outside points on the on the boundary which which are which are odd so so that's the third miniature the fourth miniature is already something i have uh, looked at already uh, mentioned already last time it actually justifies to look at manifolds and especially in the case when you have the four color theorem, there's nothing lost by looking at two manifolds, so especially two spheres. When, it was, when you want to color a planar graph, you, you can make it harder by coloring a maximal planar graph. And then when, they, when there are necks like that, when, they are, when, it's, when, it's, when it's not four connected, meaning you can take away three edge vertices and then it falls apart, then you can color each part and glue it together. But so you actually only need to color four connected graphs. And uh, so four connected maxima planar graphs are spheres provided. I mean, the, the bigger or equal to six is just to exclude the K4. It's four connected by chance because if you take away three, you end up with just with one vertex. If you had two, then already this is no more uh, four connected, right? You can take this away, this part away. This part is separated from this part. Quinney was a very tasteful mathematician, in my, my opinion. Others of his time, like uh, Deram or Alexander, or that is all friends, by the way, and uh, uh, Deram and Alexander, they were even climbing together in the Swiss mountains. So they, they shared a lot of uh, uh, ideas, but they had kind of, I think, very, very good taste. Also Hoff, yeah, and you also Hoff. So that's uh, that's the that's the uh, sphere sphere characterization. Number five, I've already mentioned also last time. It's the it's it's a very beautiful thing. So you what you want what, what you want to do is you want to define a geodesic flow. For example, on this graph here, there is no geodesic flow. You can continue here through because it's six. But here we have one, two, three, four, five. We have a five degree vertex. So we don't know how to continue. Shall we go here or shall we go here? Continue like that. And then we can, we can actually do that. So here we have a, a, a kind of a closed path when we have done this additional cutting here. We have a disc where every interior point has even degree. And now we can define a billiard. We can look at that. Uh, so in this case, when you would come here, you would go back. All right. It, 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 so there's a, there's, a, there's a unique billiard or geodesic flow if you have no boundary. But it's also a key to actually constructively get a cutting. If O of M is, M, is, is not empty, you can get rid of it by just building a, a path from, from one point to the other, cutting through. So that's kind of very constructive, and that's what, how I do it when I actually want to get a, a, a graph, want to make it on area. And that's also important for, for the next thing, which is uh, the problem, the four color theorem, is actually applied by the ability to edge re refine a, an, a ball, a three-dimensional ball. It's kind of a little bit more difficult game than in two dimensions, because what happens is if you make an edge refinement, you add the dual 
circle into the into the set OM. So or if it was in OM, you get rid of it. So what what you essentially want to do in that game is you want to you want to write this set O of M or O of G, this uh, this odd set of this Fisk variety. You want to write it just as a union of these uh, circles. So they should be enough. But one of the difficulties, once you start cutting, you produce more and more that the, the space becomes bigger. So, so you cannot work in a in a in a in a, in a linear algebra setting because the, the space while you while you're working, you make the space of you know loops, uh, one-dimensional loops, unions of one-dimensional loops. You make this larger. But I have no doubt this is possible to do and. Uh, constructively by just cleaning out more and more a larger and larger ball within a ball and uh, at the boundary what you have to do at the boundary at this membrane you have always to do this this refinement so that it stays oil airy and so that when you it stays oil airy that at the very end you have really no problem with uh, with closing so that's kind of the the, the motivation to look at this uh, especially in three dimensions to look at this situation you have a three-dimensional ball you have this set of edges which are odd, and you want to get rid of them by cutting away, by writing it as a combination of, of dual, uh, dual circles. Now, uh, very interesting is also, that's kind of a little bit unnecessary here for that, but you can also worry what happens when you want, when you want to also color up to the, up to the, up, up to the boundary. You want you want to actually get rid of this is an example this is an example where the the set is empty right so what I want to do is I want to get rid of the odd degree vertices so what I can do is I can cut here so now these are fine I can uh, cut here I can cut here <coughs> I'm, I'm I'm already done <coughs> the length of was equal to six and it was possible to do. So let's just try to do that with four, five. So it doesn't work with a... So what I can uh, try to do, is so I have this, so I got rid of this. So I have still a pair of uh, odd. See, how can we get rid of this? So let me just try to get rid of that. Okay, so number eight is an, a nice formula of Fisk, which gives the set O of G plus H for a join in terms of the uh, of the odd sets in G and H and allow you to, to get the Fisk variety of say a three sphere. I show you here three sphere and uh, which is the join of C5 with C5. This is something which has been considered by Fisk already and then there are two closed circles. So in a three-dimensional manifold a three-dimensional sphere, what happens is this is a, a, a one-dimensional variety in this, uh, this, in this three-sphere. Under some conditions it's a manifold and I mean, we'll just come to this when, is this, a, when is this a manifold. But that's very useful here to construct examples where you have uh, also in higher dimensions where you can, where you can see the structure of, the, of this fisk variety better but it's largely unexplored what 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 possible uh, structures you can get now this is really an uh, interesting new uh, uh, thing that only has been obtained uh, recently i have only got that recently which is a, a condition for which under which this fisk variety is a manifold and what we need is that in every unit sphere the Fisk set is either empty or every unit sphere we have a in every unit sphere which is d minus one sphere we have a we have a knot right we have a a, a, a single d minus three sphere that's co-dimension two sphere in a sphere is what we call a knot right? so this is a this is a one knot in a in a three sphere and we and you put it in a three sphere three sphere is after what is obtained after compactification of three-dimensional space. So it doesn't matter whether we, we take everything at the boundary and identify it with a point, and we get a three-dimensional sphere. So that's this room here 
is a three-dimensional ball. If I would take everything on the boundary and identify to one point, I get a three-dimensional sphere. And so what we have is here, this is a knot in a three-dimensional three -dimensional sphere. So if every unit sphere in a four manifold is uh, uh, the, the Fisk set is a, is a knot there, in that case, when this is, uh, when this is a, a, a sphere, then we have, uh, we have a, a D minus two manifold. So that's quite an interesting thing, especially kind of for four manifolds. That's a very interesting thing, which has not been studied much. What we get in a four manifold, we get this Fisk manifold. This Fisk set is, is a two manifold. And so I don't know of an example yet, example where it is higher, higher genus surface. Right? But that still needs to be explored. Also in force in higher dimensions, five dimensions. In five dimensions, this Fisk set is a three dimensional three manifold. And uh, so what we, what we, if we have uh, every four unit sphere, which is a four sphere, has as the Fisk set a two dimensional sphere or empty, then, uh, then, we, get the, then we get the manifold. So that's this, this uh, exciting topic here. And finally, I want just to mention something which is kind of also historically interesting, that whole topic of uh, uh, these odd parts of a, of, a, of, a, of a manifold somehow go back to Eberhardt. And uh, Eberhardt was a, was a mathematician, was a blind mathematician, geometer. Uh, you can see him here. And he was, he was showing, for example, that if you take a two sphere and any configuration of vertices is, is, is possible, degree vertices is possible as long as gauss bonnet is satisfied. So the, the, the curvature in two dimensions is, uh, in two dimensions is, of course, then if that's this, that's this Levitt formula, it's the S of X over six, that's the curvature. And uh, if the sum of these curvatures is equal to two, so if the sum of these curvatures is equal to two, then you can realize it. For example, you can realize a five, seven configuration, which is here. So this you can realize five, seven. <coughs> Locally, you can patch in a 5-7 configuration because it has zero curvature. You can glue that in. But it's interesting that you cannot glue this into a torus. So you cannot glue in into a torus such a, a even if it's flat, you cannot glue in such a 5-7 particle configuration. And uh, so there are global constraints. And uh, uh, one can see this using the Burgers vector. Give you a, a, a reference here of a paper. So it's quite interesting, and that's a difference between classical differential geometry and the discrete geometry. And you have in, in classical geometry, if you have a if you have a if you have a flat part of a manifold, but the curvature is zero, and you can you glue in something a, a, a ball where the, all the curvature is, is is inside, and as long as this is realizable, uh, the total curvature is 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 one. You can you can glue that into the you can glue that into the into the manifold. And the only constraint is Gauss Gauss Bonnet, <coughs> and uh, that's not possible in the discrete. So you cannot glue in a, a five seven. This five seven configuration has total curvature, inner curvature zero. So you cannot put that into a into a flat torus. So that's it for today. And stop wearing this uh, terrible ring. I plan to do next time something completely different if I if I've had the energy to do something else. So maybe arithmetic of graphs. I don't yet know. <clears throat>